All right. Welcome to our Finance Friday weekly wealth creation course. Uh, my name is Jerry Feta. I'm the owner, founder, and CEO of a company called Wealth Dynamics. And what we do is we help families and individuals become financially educated, financially literate. We help them build solvency and really achieve greater financial freedom in their lives. And uh, we do these courses every week. So if you're brand new, we do this every Friday, 10 p.m. Eastern time. Um, if you're a repeat person, your client, you've been tuning in for a while, welcome back. It's good to see you again. Um, and tonight we're going to talk about something called a family office strategy. One of my favorite topics for me, this is one of the, I'm not going to say the end goal, but it's one of them. It's one of the end goals of building wealth and building financial freedom. So we're going to talk about what that is and how it works. Okay. Now, um, before we dive into this, as always, I want to cover our ground rules. Um, so first things first, if there's anything I say that doesn't make sense, anything at all, it's either going to be vocabulary or it's going to be math. Okay, there's either going to be a word that I said that went over your head. That's all right. We don't, none of us know everything, right? Or it's going to be a math problem. It's going to be some kind of a mathematical formula calculation regarding what we're talking about tonight that didn't make sense either. We're not all math whizzes. In 10th grade, I used the back of the book and I looked at the answers all the time. I was, I was somebody that, that wasn't immediately able to see the numbers in my head. So um, if there's anything that doesn't make sense, ask questions. I will go live and answer your questions intermittently. So if you have questions, drop them in the chat, drop them in the comments. Um, we will take some intervals and, and answer questions. If you're on Zoom, we'll actually mic up and talk. Okay, I love chatting with people live on Zoom. So um, make sure you do that. And then if you're on Facebook, I'll just read it the old school way and uh, we'll answer it that way. Second thing that I wanna go over that I cover every week is I want you to have a purpose for being here. Why are you here? Okay, seriously, it's, it's Friday. It's 10 p.m. on a Friday. Why are you watching this right now? You could be out with your family. You could be having a dinner. You could be out you know, at the bar. I don't know what you do. You could be watching Netflix, but instead you're here. Okay, why is that? And what is your purpose and reason for being here? And the, the, the reason that I say that is without a purpose, it's hard to learn anything, right? If I'm learning something and I don't plan on using it, I don't plan on applying it, I'm not going to retain it. I'm not going to be thinking about how it practically works in my life. I'm not going to be, you know, <clears throat> you know, working it out in my head or sketching it or demoing it or trying to figure out what things mean because I'm just mindlessly consuming content. Okay. So tonight guys is not a TikTok video. Is not something you're just going to swipe and watch the next one and mindlessly scroll through. I want you engaged. I want you thinking about what am I going to do with the information here tonight? Okay. So that leads me to my next point. You can't learn anything. Oops, sorry. I kicked the camera there. You can't learn anything if you think you know it all already. So we have to get rid of the preconceived notion that I know it all. My, my backstory, which I'll go into in a little bit, guys, I was a, a licensed mainstream financial advisor. Okay. With several large firms, one of the largest firms in the country at one point. And I had the realization in that position in my life that I didn't know it all. And if everybody that could have thought they knew it all, I was the guy. I had all the licenses. I had the experience. I had the tenure. I had the relationships with the big names, all of that. And I had the realization that I don't know it all. And the second realization of there's more to be learned. I can know things. I can learn. It doesn't have to be, you know, this, this, this sophisticated, complex thing, right? And that's, that's what the financial industry makes it seem like. The financial industry makes it seem like you can't learn about finances. Like the, the terms are too complicated. Like you need to hire a professional that has a bunch of letters behind their names and certificates on their wall to understand anything. That's not true. Okay. There's, there's an ability to learn. There's more to be learned. And unless I'm already wealthy and financially independent, and I would even say if I'm wealthy and financially independent, that's not the pinnacle. But if I'm not there already, you have to excuse Samson. Samson, you want to say hi? Come here, buddy. Come here. Come say hi to everyone. Good boy. Um, so that's my buddy, Samson. He actually writes all of our course material. Um, <laughs> so unless you are financially independent, there's not, there's not this like, okay, I don't need to know anything else. Part of my thing when I was, you know, a financial advisor is I would, I would decide things that the, you know, the, the, the things that I was learning were the right answer. I'd make the decision that, you know, this thing is the right answer, not because I had proved it was right, not because I, I had any evidence, but because if it wasn't the right answer, I had to keep trying. So making something the right answer was a little box I could check to be like, oh, I don't need to study that anymore. You know, there's nothing left to be learned. I, I, can, I can rest on top of my laurels and say, I know it all now. That was my strategy. And people do that with finances. You know, I'm going to do the, the beans and rice and budget till I die and pay off all my debt. That's the right answer because if it's not, there's a bunch of time and money that I've got to invest in learning about how finances actually work. 
right? Or, you know, I'm just going to stick everything in my 401k and hope that when I'm 60, it comes out of the financial convection oven and I, I die before it all runs out. Because if that's not the case, then I'm behind the eight ball. I'm 40 years old. I'm 50 years old. And I've got to go learn a bunch of stuff about money that I should have learned 20 years ago. And so mentally, a lot of times we don't make this conscious decision. Mentally, though, we check the box. I know it all. And there's nothing left to be learned because if there was, that means something bad for me. That means work. That means that I can't be lazy. That means that something is going to be inconvenient. So I want to make sure that we're, we're all in a place of learning. Okay. We're all learning so that we can become learned financial experts. Right. And, and that comes from, you know, being okay with not knowing things. So if you have a question, none of it's dumb, ask the question, right? Talk to me, go live. We'll, we'll chat about it. I would rather have you be dumb for three seconds. As you ask a question that probably everyone else is also wondering than to actually be dumb for the rest of your life. Cause you never asked and got the information. Okay. I learned that in 10th grade from a math teacher who used to throw erasers at me. Um, <laughs> so I learned something from that class, right? No wonder I had problems with math. So what I want to do tonight is I'm going to jump into our topic of a family office. Now, my backstory again is I was a mainstream financial advisor for almost half a decade, 2012 to like 2016, 2017 ish. Okay. And that was what I did. Okay. Like that was my profession from the, from the, the, the age of 18 years old till my mid twenties. Okay. And, and I eat, I slept, I breathed all of that. If anyone knows me personally, you know, when I go all in on something, I'm obsessed with it. When it was bodybuilding, that was all I did. When I decided I was going to marry Lexi, that was what I did. When I decided I was going to go into business, that was what I did. Right. And so I learned everything I needed to learn. And I got to a point where I crammed, you know, a 30 years worth of career knowledge and experience into the, the four or five years. Okay. And the result of that is I was endorsed by Dave Ramsey in like eight different States. We had multiple agents. I think we had like 15 agents at that point. Um, you know, we were doing, you know, a, a, a great expansion across the US. We're bringing in lots of revenue. We had lots of clients. We had leads coming in all over the place. And at a certain point, my world got shook. Okay. Part of my world getting shaken was I was actually financially illiterate. Okay. Believe that I was, I was securities licensed, which means I was licensed by the state and federal government to sell you investments. Okay. I passed the test with flying colors. I think I got like my main series exam that I had to take, I think I got like a 96%. Okay. The passing score, I think was 70, 75. So I got a 96. I knew this stuff. And so I, I realized at one point that I don't know this. There's something about finances that I'm missing. And I'm going to relate this to a story. Back in the day when I used to do bodybuilding, I had a buddy that I worked out. His name was Zach. Okay. Zach was about five foot three and just freaking stacked. Okay. He was a running back in high school. Um, 190 pounds, probably like 8% body fat. And so because of this, Zach was way stronger than I was. Not only was he way stronger than I was, he didn't have to move the weights as far. Like when we did squats, it was terrible. I had, I'm not super tall. I'm 5'9", 5'10". I'd had to stand all the way up and sit all the way down. Go all the way up and sit all the way down. Zach was like a freaking little piston. He barely, like he would just like bend his knees and he was already sitting with the squat bar. So he would put like 500 pounds on his back and he just boom and come back up and boom and come back up. But what I realized was Zach at times would lift less weight than I did. And I knew he was stronger and he looked like he was struggling. And I couldn't figure that out for the longest time. I was a personal trainer. And then I realized it's because he was putting more focus and intention on each rep. So when he was going down, he was really squeezing. He was really making sure his muscles were working. He was really focusing and then pushing back up. And I share that story as an analogy because a similar thing happened with me when I was a financial advisor. I started talking to wealthy people. When I started talking to wealthy people, I realized they weren't doing the stuff that I was doing. So who's right? The guy who thinks he's right with the lower stats or the guy with the higher stats, who's not doing any of the stuff that the, the other guy's doing. Okay. I have to say the guy with the higher stats, the gal with the higher stats, that's the person who is mathematically correct because it shows up in their results. Right. Like, like imagine if I'm, if I'm talking about investing and I've got, you know, at the time, maybe like a $10,000 net worth. And I'm talking to a guy that's worth 10, $20 million. And, and for the life of me, I can't get him to understand what a mutual fund is. And I know he's not dumb and I know he's not financially literate, but he's like, yeah, I, I understand the technical jargon, but explain to me, what is it? Cause I don't get it. There's something I'm missing. And so I would spend, you know, like like time and time again, trying to get this guy to get it. And he just never would. And I finally realized it wasn't because he didn't get it. It was because I didn't get it. There was something about it. I didn't understand. 
Okay. And that hit me like a ton of bricks. And I started looking at, okay, well, if I don't understand finances and I'm a licensed financial advisor with all of this experience and all of these, you know, pedigree and all this other stuff, what am I missing? Okay. And, and that's what led me on this journey. So we're going to talk tonight about something called a family office. This is something the top 1% use. Um, I've talked about family offices before. So I'm going to give you some repeat context, but I don't want to spend too much time on the story. So the family office goes back actually to the 1900s. This is something that John D. Rockefeller came up with. Um, he coined it. I'm sure other people were doing it, but he's the one that coined it. And so what happened was he was running Standard Oil at the time, you know, Shell, ExxonMobil, Tesoro, Chevron, all these oil companies you see today, all of them used to be one company. That one company was called the Standard Oil Company. It was owned by John D. Rockefeller. John Rockefeller was the wealthiest man in the world. Even in today's dollars, inflation adjusted, nobody touches him. Elon doesn't get close to him and, and, and Bezos doesn't get close to him either. So Rockefeller was a very wealthy man. Didn't have social media. I don't even think the man had telephones. I think they were still doing everything on telegraph and paper. And somehow he built this gigantic uh, national enterprise. And so what happened is in the late 1900s, he actually retired from Standard Oil. He gave up his position as, as the operator of that business. He put his CEOs and his executives in place. And instead he focused on his family's wealth. He said, I'm done with the company. Like the business is built. It funds my lifestyle. It does what I need to do. Now I'm going to focus intently on investing and building up generational wealth. Okay. Now at the time where he was running Standard Oil, he was already the wealthiest man in the United States by a long shot. So it wasn't like he was this piddly nobody that had this, you know, overnight success story. Already a wealthy guy. Okay. He stops operating Standard Oil and he focuses full time on his family's investments. His net worth quadrupled when he did that. Okay. Already the wealthiest man in the United States. His net worth goes up by four times, guys. Think about that. Like if you're already, you know, a, a multi millionaire or multi billionaire and his net worth goes up four times. Okay. Something happened. Okay, in my business and in my life, when a stat goes up like that, I immediately look at what caused the affluence because I want to do that again. I want to repeat the thing that made my stat go up. So when I look at someone else's statistic and it's like, okay, this guy's already worth near half a billion dollars in today's inflation in just adjusted money and his, his, his net worth, you know, 4X, he goes all the way up there, right? Like, what did he do? Okay, so this is something he used. So a family office looks like this, okay? So you have the family, And they have their wealth. Okay. So they have all of their assets. They have all of their investments. They have their passive income. And so this is like something they built. And it comes from the premise of, okay, if they successfully build the wealth, why in the world would they delegate it to a financial advisor? Like, it doesn't matter how, how good of a financial advisor I might be. If you've built a half a billion dollar or half a, half a trillion dollar net worth, like I'm not going to be able to help you very much. Okay. Cause, cause like, what am I going to tell you? Put it in a mutual fund and like, hopefully, you know, you already built a half a half a trillion dollar net worth. I don't have very much to offer this person. Okay. So what they would do is they would actually insource, they would hire staff. So Rockefeller would hire his own accountant, his own attorneys, his own executives, his own staff, and they would actually build a company. And that company was Rockefeller's family wealth. It was a separate entity. So they're going to use either a corporation Okay, either a corporation or a trust. And this entity is going to own a bunch of other entities and all those entities are going to own assets. Okay, and then you have staff, the family has staff that manage and direct the trusts and all of these different arms and legs and entities down here where the investments are actually held. Okay. Why would, why would someone do this, right? Why would someone do this? Well, the reason someone would do this is they're thinking generationally. Okay, they're, they're beyond just retirement. Rockefeller, for example, he could have retired probably like in the, in the early years of his business when he was a millionaire back in the late 1800s, which was a ton of money in today's dollars. Like he was fine. He kept going. So this is not somebody that's motivated by comfort and, and personal satisfaction of just being able to kick their heels up and be done, right? Whether it's good or bad, a person who does this has a mission, okay? Something beyond just money. They're trying to build and create something. And so this is part of it is, is the starting point of having a family office and deciding I'm going to use a strategy like this because this is a long shot, a long shot, and it's a long game. It's not something we do overnight. It takes a lot of time and effort. So for me to commit to that, I have to have something bigger than just, okay, I want to be comfortable. 
Okay. Okay. I want to be, I want to be retired early. Oh, great. Now what? You're going to go to the beach every day. Okay. Like that's not a purpose. You're not going to drive and do all this hard work just for that. Okay. And if, and if your goal is simply, I just want to retire when I'm 60 and hopefully die before I run out of money and maybe leave a little bit behind for my kids. This isn't the plan for you, right? Like go, go see the financial advisor and buy the mutual funds. That's who that's for. Okay. But this is for the person that says, no, no, no. I see money as a tool. And I know that that tool can be used for good or bad. And I want to use it for good. And I want to, I want to leave my kids and my grandkids and my churches and my charities and my communities like far better off than I ever found them. And generationally, meaning like my kids and grandkids and their grandkids, all of them benefit. Okay. Fast forward to today, Rockefeller's uh, family office still exists. His trust still exists. I think, and you'll have to Google this. I think it's still like a hundred million dollars. Okay. Rockefeller died, I believe in nine, nine, 1937. Okay. So think about that's almost a hundred years ago. And he's still got like a hundred over a hundred million bucks left in his family's trust. And it's not just sitting there. It's paying beneficiaries. It's paying his grandkids. There's third and fourth generation Rockefellers living off income from investments that a guy made over a hundred, almost a hundred years ago. Decisions that, that, you know, John D Rockefeller made and three or four generations down the line, they're still benefiting from it. Now we have two choices with something like this. We can look at this guy. We could pick him apart. I read his biography, Titan, okay? 30, 37 hours, I think, on, on Audible. If you actually listen to it, it's as thick as the Bible. I read that book twice, okay? There was a lot of stuff Rockefeller did where I was like, yeah, that's, that's suppressive. I wouldn't do that. Like, those are naked. But there are things he did right. Money is an inanimate object. It's amoral. So it just makes us more of who we already are. So if I give you half a trillion dollars and you're a good person, you're going to do really good things with that. Okay. Like you're going to, you're going to actually improve conditions for mankind. The money would be in the hands of the right people. If I give half a trillion dollars to someone evil, someone that's suppressive, someone that's negative, someone that doesn't like mankind and doesn't want to help, they're going to do selfish things with it. And they're going to do harmful things with it. They're going to do things like trying to block the sun or trying to, I think, I think I mentioned the, the Nestle guy that wants to control the water supply. It's like, what's the benefit of that? Like that literally is like the bad guy from the Simpsons. Okay. Like you'll become the bad guy from the Simpsons, but here's the thing. You already were the bad guy from the Simpsons. You just got money now, right? And now you get to do all your weird little stuff because you got the money. So the question is, am I a good person? Do I have good intentions? Okay, and if I do, isn't it kind of my responsibility to help? Isn't it kind of my responsibility to build wealth? And if I have, here's the thing, like it goes back to, I don't need all that. It's not about what you need. It's about what everyone else needs. Okay, if I only live my life based on what I need, that's selfish. Like I'm not like there are there are literally people that don't have water tonight. There are people that don't have food tonight. There are people that are being sex trafficked. Like there's so much stuff out there for me to just say, well, it doesn't personally benefit me because that's really what I don't need all of that means. Okay, like that's basically selfish. It's me saying because it doesn't benefit me, I'm not going to help. Okay, you and if that's the attitude, it's a good thing you don't have money. Okay, because you'd probably make decisions like that. If it doesn't benefit me, I'm not doing it. If it doesn't benefit me, I'm not helping. If it doesn't benefit me, I'm not getting involved, right? Maya says, let's go to the beach every day. Maya, you live like 10 minutes from the beach. You could go to the beach every day. Don't act like you don't know that's true. Um, so this is the purpose of the family office. It's a lot bigger than me and it's something generational. Now, this is something I want to hit. I'm going to dive into some of the, the mechanics of this in a second. I've heard people say, I don't want to leave anything behind for my kids. Okay. And, and it might sound weird, but they're coming from, okay, well, I want them to work for it. Or, you know, they, I don't want them to be trust fund snobs. That's you. If, if you have kids and grandkids and you're worried about them doing the wrong things with money, if you leave it to them, that's because you taught them that way. Okay. And I, I know that's a hard thing to hear, but they observed your behavior and that's why they act the way they act. You, you created them. They're your children. They're your grandchildren. So if anyone had the ability to make sure that if they got wealth and a fortune, they do the right thing, it was you. And you still have the ability. Now, here's the thing is there's no such thing as leaving nothing behind, okay? You either leave behind good things or bad things. There's no such thing as nothing. So if I leave nothing behind, what I actually left behind was poverty. I left my great kids and grandkids poverty. It wasn't nothing, right? There's no such thing as nothing. It was poverty. Like I left them no, no means no education, no opportunity. I didn't leave them better than I found them, right? That's poverty. 
So I'm either leaving assets, good things, wealth, you know, uh, inside of the trust, you can have provisions and different rules and different things they've got to learn about and follow. That's all allowable, but you can leave that behind. That's going to help them in their lives, right? Or you can leave them poverty. You can leave them, you know, negative experiences, financial burdens, lack of financial education. It's, it's like lack of financial education for your kids is like not teaching them how to feed themselves. You know, for a fact, they're going to have to work and get a job and they're going to deal with money. Why in the hell would you not teach them about money? It's like not teaching them how to eat, breathe, and go to the bathroom. You know they're going to have to do it. Okay, to, in my opinion, that's wrong. I wouldn't, I wouldn't prepare, like, I wouldn't have kids and, and grandkids and be like, okay, I'm, I'm going to make sure that they never know how to feed themselves. Or even if it's not intentional, like, I know that they're, they have to feed themselves, but it, I don't know, I don't know how to feed myself very well, so I'm not even going to try. Like, we've got to instill this stuff. The family office is how we do this. So it starts first from a place of scale and, and mission and purpose. All of that stuff, like big picture, big thinking. Okay, that's at the very top of this. Okay, the very bottom is okay. Well, what am I going to have this doing for me? So think about this: when you're building wealth, there's a couple things we do. Number one, we get financially literate, financial literacy. Okay, this means we study about money. We actually spend time investing about of investing money. Now, another thing I want to share: being a business owner does not mean you're financially literate. Okay, there's this idea that because I'm an entrepreneur or a salesperson and I know how to bring in money, it means I know about money. No, no, it doesn't. Those are not the same things. That's like saying, because I know how to eat, I'm also a chef. Unless you're a chef, you're not a chef. Okay, so I can't spend my time just on my business, just at my job, just making sales, just earning income, just doing anything. I have to actually learn about money. Okay, learning about money means I understand the difference between mediums of exchange, stores of value, and investments. I understand things like taxation and inflation, and I understand where they come from, how they work, why they happen, and how to plan for them. Right? Those are actual real things that I would have and, and possess as knowledge if I was financially literate. If I don't possess them, I'm not financially literate, even if I'm a successful entrepreneur, even if I'm an accountant. Guys, I know accountants that they're like, I know about, all about money. No, no, you know the tax code. Okay, you, you could be a financially literate accountant. You can be a financially literate attorney. You can be a financially illiterate whatever because unless you study money, that's the only way to know about money. It doesn't have come through osmosis. Your parents can't genetically pass it down to you. You actually have to go learn, right? So financial literacy is the first step here. We gain financial literacy. Number two is we gain solvency. Okay, what does solvency mean? Solvency means number one, I earn more than I spend. Okay, I earn more than I spend. I own more than I owe, right? I'm properly protected. Okay, I've got reserves. I have, you know, no consumer debt. Like those are all things that make me solvent. Solvent means I have the ability to like pay. I can keep myself afloat. When bills come up, they're covered, right? I've, I've got surpluses. I've got cash. I've got reserves. So I achieve solvency next. Once I achieve solvency, I've got to break out of the financial traps, okay? This is the one that's hard to confront. I got to break out of the financial traps. For there to be financial traps, that means there has to be people trapping you, okay? Not everybody is just good and they want the best for you. There's a lot of financial institutions out there, chain banks, Wall Street firms, government agencies, right? Their goal is to take your money. They want you working for them, right? That's why they want you to have a car payment because they get a percentage of your income for the rest of your life, for the rest of your life, because you always trade the vehicle in. It's always got negative equity. You've always got to make the payment and they just keep making Every year, the price goes up 500 bucks. Then you refinance into another one. Now it's 700 bucks a month. And then you, you turn it over and get another one. And now it's a thousand bucks a month. And they're going to take your money for the rest of your life. They're going to tell you to put money in their savings accounts. Okay. What are they going to do? They're going to pay you 0.01% interest. They're going to loan the money out. They're going to trade it with hedge funds and foreign currency and all the stuff we talk about and make double and triple digit returns and then pay you 0.10%. By the way, if they lose your money, they're going to do what's called a bail-in where they don't give you your deposits because they have to pay their bills. Check out Dodd-Frank Act. That's in there. Okay. There's Wall Street firms. Every single movie about Wall Street involves criminality. We all know they're criminals. Why would we give them our money? Because they're experts at marketing. No different. Why would I smoke a cigarette when I know it's going to give me cancer? Marketing. Why would I eat a McDonald's when I know it's literally dog food? Marketing. Right? It doesn't mean they're good. It just means they're good at marketing. Okay, why would I not watch the news when I, I know for a fact they're lying? Marketing. Doesn't matter which channel, you know it's the truth, right? So they're experts at marketing to get your money. 
everything banks and Wall Street have ever come up with as a product or a service was created in a boardroom. And the sole purpose, the valuable final product for them is make as much money as we can without going to prison. Okay. Sometimes they don't get the second one right. And that's where you see movies about them. Okay. All the other times they managed to get the second one, right? We made as much money as we could off the consumer without going to prison. Job well done. Check the box. Okay. Every wall street bank product. If you look at the way it's structured, there's no guarantee about it other than them getting paid. The fees and commissions always guaranteed, but they can't tell you that past performance equals future results. They can't tell you anything other than here's what we think might happen, but we can't guarantee anything. And we need you to sign right here saying you understand that. And also we're still going to get paid. Okay. Same thing with the IRS. That's suppressive taxation. Why would you take somebody's production and blow it on a bunch of people that don't produce anything? You're penalizing the upstats and rewarding the downstats, no matter what way you look at it. Okay. So Wall Street, chain banks, and the IRS, these are the financial traps. Anything that they touch isn't good for you. You can already assume it's a freaking Halloween evening with an apple and a razor blade in the middle. That's what they're selling you. Okay. So if you're, if you're like, man, I want to build a family office. Good. Better get rid of the mortgage. Better get rid of the car payment. Better stop putting money in the 401k. Okay. Better learn about the tax code because we can't do these things if we're stuck. Okay. If we're trapped. We can't move forward. That's the purpose of a trap. The purpose of a trap is to hold you in one location. Okay. In, in, in Alaska where I'm from, when you trap animals, that's what you do. You, you clamp their ankle or their foot or whatever so that they cannot run away. And then they either bleed out and die, or you can approach them and kill them. Okay, I hate to be that graphic with it, but the purpose of a trap is to make it to where you can't move. Okay, so if you can't make financial progress, they're winning and you're losing and it's at your expense. So we break out of the financial traps. We then start investing, okay? Now here's where I wanna talk about the first steps of building a family office. We start investing, right? When do we invest? We invest when we've done all of these things, right? All of these things, by the way, are investments. If you're, if you're gaining financial literacy, if you're gaining solvency, if you're getting out of debt, you're getting rid of the financial traps, those are investments. There's, there's not like, you know, I'm in the kiddie pool and, and they're in the deep end. No, you're investing. You're investing in yourself. You're investing in your, your solvency. You're investing in your freedom. It doesn't matter that it's not a real estate deal. You're still investing, okay? So when I do start investing in income producing assets, that's the purpose of it. We've talked about this on and on and on the last couple of weeks. I'm not going to go into this, but we invest right now only for passive income. Okay. We're looking for two things, safe and passive. We don't want to lose money and we want to make sure we're getting that passive income. Those are the only things we're looking at right now. When we start doing these investments, we're going to start stacking up. Let's say we invest every $50,000 and we're making 12% per year on that money. We're making 500 bucks a month at a time. And we start stacking these $500 a month payments up, right? And what happens? Okay, a couple of things happen. We're, we're saving more, which is awesome. Okay, but now we have more income coming in. We've got more tax statements. We've got more escrow accounts. And it's going to start getting a little bit administratively loaded, meaning I'm going to have to be like dealing with this stuff. It, sure, the income is passive and you're going to have this stuff with anything, but I've got more tax forms. I've got more, more accounting to do. I've got more you know, bank accounts to pay attention to. I've got more stuff in my life. And so I'm already doing what I've been doing, which is producing income and learning about money and all this stuff. And I've got my family life and my fitness and everything else I do. Now there's these new jobs that come up. For a while, I'm just going to be raking in the passive income and I'm going to be doing these jobs. But at a certain point, I've got enough passive income coming in, right? These keep stacking up and keep stacking up where I'm saving 40% of my income and I have surplus above and beyond that. Okay. When I have this surplus, this is where I make my first hire. Okay. This is where the family office actually starts. This is on the, the blueprint of financial freedom. If you're a client of mine, this is going to be around phase four ish, right? You've done maybe five or six private lending deals. You're doing some foreign currency. We're actually setting up a trust on phase four for you. So it meshes in perfect. And now you're like, okay, great. I'm going to hire someone part-time right now. Okay. What are they going to help with? Here's, here's the thing. And this is where like, we're going to take a, a jump from like finances and wealth building into actually building a business. Okay. Your first hires are going to help you with the things that you've already done. So you've done them before. We're not going to hire people to do things we've never done guys. Like how can, how, as a business owner, I learned this the hard way. 
How can I hold someone accountable to doing something I've never done? How do I know what the standard is? How do I know like when they have a problem, right? And they're like, hey, how do I, how do, I do this? I can't answer it because I've never done it before. And then they're going to quit because their job's too hard and their boss doesn't know what they're talking about. So I'm, I'm going to hire people to do things I've done, things that I've documented, okay? And things that I have duplicated. These are like the three Ds. I just came, just came up with these right now, but this would be the three that I would do. I want to have them done before, right? So I've done them. I've documented them. I've written down the system. I've written down how I did it. And then I've duplicated it. I've turned it literally into almost like a franchise. Like somebody could actually like pick up the packet or watch the video and duplicate the thing that I've done and documented. Okay. I'm only going to hire these things out. Now I'm going to plug my, my friend Maya really quick. Um, most of this stuff is going to be bookkeeping initially. Okay. Income showing up. You need to know your 1099s, right? You're going to need a bookkeeper for that. Taxes. You're going to need tax prep and, and accounting and profit and losses. Right? Like all of these things initially are going to be bookkeeping. So this would be a great time if you haven't done it already. Phase four, hire a bookkeeper. It's like having a virtual CFO almost. Okay. Not quite because you're still going to be the CFO of your business. You're not going to get rid of that hat yet, but you're going to have someone that comes in and helps. Okay. This is the first hire. So again, I have to have done it and proceeding doing it again. I would have to have the knowledge. Okay. Which does mean if I'm not spending time learning about finances, if I'm not investing in my financial literacy, probably never going to be able to do most of these things. Okay. And if I never do most of these things, I'm never going to be able to document them. And if I've never documented them, I'm never going to be able to duplicate them, which means I will never hire someone. Okay. If I can't invest first in my financial literacy, and I know that doesn't sound sexy and cool, but I'm telling you, this is where, where wealth starts. It starts with financial literacy. It doesn't start with, with TikTok videos and Bitcoin and, and NFTs and meme stocks and Robinhood accounts. Okay, those are like financial cigarettes. Like, you, great, you're awesome. You're, you look cool, awesome. I hope your friends like your, 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 your little deal you got going on, but it doesn't transfer into anything for you. Okay, literacy first. Learn about money, spend time, invest money, learning about money so that you can do these things, document them and duplicate them. And then you can hire and actually have this real concept of a family office. Okay. Now, real quick, I want to take a, a break to answer some questions. We've got some questions stacking up here. Um, so again, if you're on Zoom, I want you to drop your questions in the chat. If you're on Facebook, put them in the comments. Um, let's hit our, our Facebook questions first. Good to see everybody. By the way, if you're on Facebook, share this, get this information out there. Literally no one else is sharing this stuff. So if you've got friends, family, employees, coworkers, people in your life that you want financial freedom for them, the best way to do that is share the video so they can see it. Um, good to see everybody. Justin says, how about those $2,000 shoes? Justin, when you have a family office, you and I will go $2,000 shoe shopping together. I don't know that we'll wear them. We might destroy them for fun after. That seems like something we might do, but I promise you we'll go shoe shopping for $2,000 shoes together and we'll put it on Instagram um, and, and the beach. We can go to the beach, but again, we live at the beach. Good to see you, Maya. Um, Justin says, children can be taught how to be good stewards of money. The primary, the primary teacher will be our example. Exactly, guys. Kids, they, they, they learn by observation. Okay, I remember being a kid. It wasn't that long ago. Most of the time my parents said something, I called bullshit. I was like, that's not real because I see you do something different. So I'm going to follow what I see you doing, not what I hear you say. So if we want to really be um, you know, good at educating our kids and leaving a legacy for them, it starts with our own financial literacy and our own financial behavior and what we actually do with our money, not what we tell them to do. Good to see you, Katrina, Andrew, uh, Bob, good to see you. Justin says, I use Maya and Solvency now for bookkeeping and payroll. I highly recommend them for both. Amazing. I do too. That's awesome. Good. Let's jump into our Zoom questions. I see we have a handful here. First one is from Mark. Let me bring Mark on live here. I see we have a handful here. First one is from Mark. All right. I think we've got Mark on live. Let me mute my Facebook just so it's not giving us double feedback. Good. We should have Mark on. Mark, can you hear me? I can hear you, uh, Jerry. Awesome. Awesome. How are you tonight? I'm great. Uh, how about you? Uh, nice to see you every Friday evening. Absolutely. My pleasure. Thanks for being on. Let me, let me fix my feedback issue. I'm still getting a little bit of a, a noise feedback on Facebook. That should be better. Okay. 
Great. What is your question today, Mark? I actually have a couple of questions. Uh, first one being when you mentioned financial literacy, is, is that the same thing as uh, uh, learning about economics and how, you know, basic macroeconomics works or is that in a different realm? Yeah, that's a good question. So it's going to be a little bit of both. You're going to do macro and micro, right? So macro, big picture, what's happening with the economy and, and the Fed. And then micro is more like, okay, what's happening with my own personal financial life and statements, uh, balance sheets, profit and losses, my own stuff. Okay, got it. And uh, my second question is about uh, the actual family office. Uh, are they regulated by the F SEC or... Uh, if not, why aren't they? Yeah, so so the family office, there's two different types. The type that we're talking about is called a single family office, and it's not regulated by the SEC because it, it literally would be like the equivalent of you starting your own business. You're not raising money from investors. You're not advising other people. Um, there is something called a multiple family office, which basi basically is like a glorified wealth management firm. Um, they, they, they provide more robust um, services and it's kind of concierge, but it technically is just wealth management. Some of those would be regulated by the SEC, but that's not what we're talking about here tonight. We're talking about single family offices. Oh, okay, got it. Thanks for that clarification. Awesome. My pleasure. And then did you have something about um, a solo K? Oh, yeah, I put that in the question and answer. I, I do have a solo 401k. Um, it's less than that $500,000 threshold that requires you to file a tax return. Um, but the, 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 the company that helped me set it up um, is asking if I would want to have audit protection. And um, I'm not sure if I really need it at this point. Um, and wanted your thoughts on uh, how to proceed moving forward to, to, to get it or not to get it or... Not yeah. sure how to do it. Yeah, that's a good question. So um, with the solo 401k, if you're if you're over $250,000, you have to file what's called a form 5500. Um, that's something that your CPA should be able to do. If they can't, um, you can usually get a third party administrator to do that for you. With the solo K world, you have to realize I'm going to sketch this out because this is something that my firm helps with. Um, you have document providers. So these are, this is like a group that you might talk to. You also have um, custodians and you have trustees. And then you have what's called a TPA, a third party administrator. So a document provider, and this is where you have to watch out. And I've done this before. This is, we changed our business model because this isn't very effective. Document providers are li literally just selling you an adoption agreement. They're going to um, TIAA or whatever company that builds 401k plans, they're buying a document for a couple hundred dollars and then reselling it for a couple thousand dollars. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that, but you have to realize you're literally just buying the document. The company that usually set it up doesn't have any sort of expertise or they're not legally like, you know, they're not a 401k management company. You have a custodian, right? A custodian is like an IRA or 401k custodian. We work with our, our own custodian now so that we can do document provision and custodial and trustee. Um, these are actually people that actually like keep your account compliant. They monitor your tax forms. Um, they do all of the legal and compliance. Now you also have what's called a third party administrator, a third party administrator. They're kind of like the third, you know, third party, right? Third party, but they're like quality control. So they're making sure that, um, you know, your plan numbers are correct. The accounting is correct. They might help with tax forms, filing your form 5,500. Um, they might help with IRA compliance or, or IRS compliance. Now, typically, if you worked with just a document provider, if they're selling you 5,500 work or IRS audit protection, unfortunately, and I'm not going to say this is a blanket statement, but unfortunately, most of the time it is kind of gimmicky. Um, an adoption agreement is already pre-approved by the IRS. So there's nothing to audit. The only time you would need to change it is if the IRS changed the 401k provisions, which they don't do that often. It might be every, every five to 10 years. If you're working with a custodian or a trustee, they're automatically going to update, update that. So if the IRS changes something, they're going to let you know, say, hey, Mark, IRS changed this rule. This affects your 401k. So we need to update your adoption agreement so that it's compliant. Um, now, the other aspect is then again, okay, filing 5500s and other things that might come up. This is where you would maybe work with a third party administrator. These people are licensed to do that. So it's actually like something they've got to go through and they have some oversight 
or you could work with a CPA on that. So um, I hope that answers your question, Mark. Uh, it, it does to a certain point, but uh, like I said earlier, uh, my 401k has less than 250,000. Uh, it's under my business. So I, I don't even file that 5,500 form. So yeah. um, in essence, why would I need audit protection from the IRS when I'm not even filing a form 5,500, right? That's the way I'm looking at it. Yeah, that might be kind of gimmicky. I would look into that and I would try and verify if you've got a, just a document provider or if you really are working with a custodian and a trustee. Um, there is a difference there. Like I said, we used to be just a document provider and then we realized how limited we were and we're like, okay, we need a custodial relationship. So um, I would check into that on your own and just find out if that's something that um, is the case. And if it's not the case, then you probably don't need the audit protection, I would say. Okay, got it. Thank you. I will follow up on that and find out more information. Thanks, Jerry. Hey, my pleasure. My pleasure. Great questions. Let me see if we have any other questions before we dive back into our, our content here. Good. We have a couple of um, different questions from Nano. Let me bring Nano on here real quick. Um, Nano, you can, you can jump on live real quick. I might need to unmute him. Hey, oh, there Jerry, he is. How are you doing tonight, Nano? Doing great, man. You? I am good. I'm good. Thanks for asking. What is your question? Well, not necessarily a question, right? Because you were asking about what was the Rockefeller's fortune. And I looked it up online. And it says that it collectively, this, you know, his trust, it is divided among hundreds of descendants. And collectively, it is worth an estimate of $8.4 billion dollars in 2020 according to Forbes. So that was uh, what you were saying uh, earlier. So that was a lot more than I even thought. I think I said like 100 million or something. So 8.4 billion spread out. That's amazing. Thanks for sharing that. I know 8.4 billion dollars spread out amongst hundreds of beneficiaries, which are his kids, grandkids, great grandkids, almost 100 years after the guy died. That's incredible. That's, that's something we should all aspire to. Even if you don't have kids, those could be churches, those could be charities, those could be nonprofits, those could be anything you want them to be. That's amazing. Um, thanks for pointing that out. Good. So um, let me see. Let's jump back into our, our content here. So we were talking about being able to hire. Okay. So what we're looking at is when we hire our family office out, again, they're doing things, the staff that we're bringing in initially probably going to be part-time. Okay. And here's the reason why we don't want to invest and, and get, you know, four or 5,000 a month in passive income, which is like four or five, five, uh, sorry, four or 5,000 would be like 10 deals. So if you're making 500 bucks a month, 10 deals gets you to five grand. So 10 deals, that's half a million dollars we've invested. We don't want to spend a hundred percent of the income from those investments on staff, right? Cause then it's kind of like, what was the point of investing? We want to reinvest. So it compounds and builds up. Okay. So we're hiring someone initially, it's going to be part-time and it could be your, your, your bookkeeper. It could be your accountant, the first person, right? And then from there, we're starting to add more people in. Now, the way that hiring works is I do it, right? And then I document it and then I duplicate it. And the trick that you need to be able to play here and the, the problem here is a lot of business owners and entrepreneurs, we hire out of laziness. So when I'm building my family office, I am not hiring so that I don't have as much work. Okay. Cause at this level, I'm probably at, you know, a 250 to $500,000 net worth. You know, I probably got four or $5,000 a month in passive income. I'm by no means wealthy. Okay. I'm better off than a lot of America. Sure. Okay. And I'm probably going to have a great life no matter what I do. Sure. But I'm not in the top 1% yet. So I'm expanding, I'm pushing my net worth up. Okay. And so when I do it, document it and then duplicate it, and then I hire somebody, they take over this area. And then I go down to the next area, the one that I haven't been doing yet. And I start doing that and I get the hang of it. And then I document it. Okay. And then I duplicate it. And then I hire someone for that one. Now I've got two people. Okay. And then I jump down to the next one. And so every time I hire one job, I'm taking on a new one. And then I systematically go through until I've done every single function in my organization. I've documented it and I've got duplicatable policies and I've hired it out right? Now, the great thing is, is this compounds. Eventually, this first guy, he's going to get really good at his job and he's going to be able to do document and duplicate. He's going to be able to hire someone, okay? And then this guy, same thing. And then this guy, same thing. So it starts compounding almost kind of like um, Justin would get this almost kind of like with network marketing, 
you and and you get people that duplicate right and they start duplicating and bringing in more talent and then those guys duplicate and it just expands and multiplies okay if i do this right if i don't then it's going to look like okay i hired someone didn't do the work myself or didn't duplicate it or didn't document it and then it just stops and then i say there's no good people hiring's too hard let me stop this family office thing it doesn't make sense i'm you know, i'm just too difficult whatever it would be i'm just going to go back to you know wall street central banks and and the irs because that's at least easier. It doesn't take as much time. So when you get here, we will help you. Okay, we, we have uh, administrative technology we use on how you hire, train, you know, build organizations, all this stuff. It's what I use with my own companies. Okay, so we'll teach you all that stuff. Don't worry about that. But we got to get here first. Okay, Justin says network marketing done well is awesome. It, I, exactly. I don't know a better way to build an organization than with like a good, you could even take the same strategy with a company right? Like a good strategy of you hire the right people, you train them well, and then you give them autonomy to hire their own groups. And then it just expands. That's, that's literally like, that's how the body expands. That's how cells work, right? So that's, that's, that's the example that I would use. Now, your goal is you want to get to the point where you are accredited. Okay. So you're going to get to an accredited. This equals a million dollar net worth. Okay. Million dollar net worth. So if I am adding more and more investments, I get accredited. This now makes me able to invest in anything, right? It unlocks the door for me. There's investments that as an accredited investor, I can invest in and know about that non-accredited investors are not allowed to, they're off limits. So when I get here, now I can hire even more people because the investments produce better returns. I get better tax benefits and it just multiplies the game. From this point, I become financially independent, passive income, that exceeds my personal savings expenses and taxes. One of these expenses is going to be payroll because I'm going to have you know one or two or maybe even three part-time staff members at this point. Again, they're helping me with, with things like bookkeeping. They're helping me things with like your know, paperwork, uh, maybe some legal stuff, setting up entities, whatever it is that I want to have them help with. And I'm going to pay them and that's going to be part of my expenses. So my passive income needs to exceed that. Now, once I get to... PI greater than set, passive income greater than savings expenses, taxes. For most of us, it's going to happen at the two to $3 million range. Okay. Just the math tells us, tells us if I've got 2 million bucks and I'm making 12%, that's going to pay me about 20 grand a month. Okay. 20 grand a month around there. That's what I can live on. Probably pay a couple of part-time people, save, reinvest, all of that great stuff. Okay. So if it's more than that, it's more than that. My, my net worth might need to be higher at 5 million. Get yeah, $5 million net worth, I become what's called a qualified purchaser. Okay. A qualified purchaser means that I'm allowed to invest in accredited investments as a legal entity other than an individual or sole proprietor. I can invest as a corporation or a trust. Okay. Prior to 5 million, I'm not allowed to do that. So if I do, let's say, for example, an oil and gas deal and I invest as an LLC, I don't get any of the tax benefits. Right now, as a qualified purchaser, I can start doing these deals as an LLC or a corporation or a trust. What that does is it separates me from my investments. Who's ever heard the old saying, own nothing, control everything? Okay, at 5 million, you can actually do that. You can put everything in a corporation or a trust. You don't physically or personally own any of it. Your name has nothing to it. If you go bankrupt, someone sues you, whatever might happen, you're broke on paper. Everything is in your, your entities and your trusts. This happens at 5 million. Now, again, at 5 million, let's say, and we are probably making higher returns than this, but let's say you are making 12%, okay? That means that you're making, what, what does that come out to? I don't want to give you guys the wrong math. 12% on five, uh, 5 million. Is that 50 grand a month or is that 500,000? Let me just pop this into my calculator. Everyone assumes I can do math equations in my head. I can't. I need a calculator for these things. Okay, that's 50 grand a month. I was right. So this equals 50,000 a month. Okay. So I'm making 50,000 a month in passive income. And how many people could I hire now with 50,000 a month? I get to live on what? 20? I've got 30 grand left over. I can reinvest. I can hire. Now, when I get to 10 million, 10 million is where I become an actual qualified family office. Okay. 10 million also puts me in the statistical top 1% of wealth. Okay. I'm actually by statistic, a top 1%. Okay. So I'm at 10 million. I'm at 1%. I'm actually a family office. Like by definition, I meet that definition. And at 50, at, at, at 10 million, 
Again, this is a hundred grand a month, guys, a hundred thousand dollars a month passive. Okay. How many people can I hire with that? Okay. That's, that's like, that's a, a gigantic organization. Here's what I love about this. This is going to be like, some of them are, you going to be your family members, your brothers, your sisters, your kids, your spouses, right? You're going to be able to actually like, you like help some people not only with a good opportunity, but an opportunity where they can learn about finances too. Imagine like, Hey, I work in my dad's family office. I'm, I'm like, I'm set. Not because of the finances I'm going to get because of the financial literacy. My job is to build wealth. I help my dad build wealth. I help my brother build wealth. I help my sister build wealth. I help my aunt build wealth. Right? So you're going to have your family. That's going to get hired into your organization. That's awesome. You're going to bring employees into it. That's also awesome. Okay. And then at this point you're financially free. Okay, at 10 million, I don't think you go backwards ever. Okay, like you're not going to go down to zero. At a million, you can still go down to zero. But at 10 million, if you're investing the way that we talk about, where you're investing in real stores of value and income producing assets, okay, things that are, are verified, tried and true, not speculating, not doing a bunch of weird stuff with crypto and meme stocks, I don't think you ever go backwards. Okay, and you're not going to spend more than $100,000 a month unless you're, you're financially illiterate, which you're not. You can't get here from scratch if you're financially illiterate. Sure, you can win it or marry it or inherit it, but you're not going to build from zero to 10 million and at the end of it be financially illiterate and spend all your money away. It literally won't happen, right? So this is what you're trying to get to. This seems like a lot of work, okay? But I want you to realize, okay, well, if I'm saving 40% of this, that's $40,000, okay? That's getting saved to reinvest, Okay. And then I've got, you know, let's say my, my living expenses, um, you know, let's say that's 20. Okay. And then I've got payroll. Okay. So my payroll, I've got 60 here. That's $40,000 a month that I can hire with. Okay. And guess what? The money that I spend on hiring, I don't have to pay taxes on because it's, it's payroll. I don't have to pay income tax on paying someone else a wage, right? So I'm reducing my taxes too. Now here's the alternative guys. Here's the crazy thing. $10 million. Let's say that I have $10 million. And instead of building a family office, I go to a financial advisor. Okay. And I say, Hey, I've got 10 million bucks and I want you to manage my money for me. Okay. A financial advisor at a minimum is going to charge you a 1% annual asset management fee. Okay. 1% of 10 million, right? So they're, they're going to charge you a hundred thousand dollars a year. to stick your money in a mutual fund you could have bought on Vanguard, to read you a statement you could have read online, to, to, to tell you, you know, financial cliches that really don't mean anything because they're not allowed to guarantee anything. They're not allowed to tell you anything definite. So when the market goes down, they're just going to tell you it's long-term, don't sell low, dollar cost average, buy while it's on sale. All these little, they're, they're memes in and of themselves of the financial industry. All these little cliche things that you hear for decades. When the market's high, they're going to be like, oh, let's be modest. You know, it's great that it's up. Remember, it's going to average out. We should buy more while it's rising. All these types of things for a hundred grand a year. Okay. You'll talk to them maybe once a month, maybe for an hour or two. So you take a hundred thousand dollars a year and divide that by two hours a month. And you tell me how much per hour you're paying that person. Are they bringing the value? Now, here's the thing. And I did the math on this today. You take 10 million and you invest that at, I think it was 10%. And you do this for 20 years with a financial advisor, okay? Without fees, it would have grown, I believe the number was 73 million. This is what you would have had if you paid them nothing, right? But this little 1% annual fee over 20 years, because that's coming out of your assets, it's not compounding, okay? It's not growing, it's not compounding, it's not building. That little 1% fee makes it to where you only have 60 million. Okay, guys, that is, I think it's either 13 or 17. I think we'll go with 13. It's in the article I wrote today. That's 13 million bucks over 20 years. Okay, when you do the math on this, it's either 13 million or 17 million. Um, when you do the math on this, this is the equivalent of paying them $650,000 a year. That's a lot of money, $650,000 a year. Now, granted, not all of this is going to them. Some of it's the opportunity cost of that 1% fee having not been there but that is a hard cost to you. You would have an additional 13 million bucks in your assets if 
you wouldn't have paid that fee. Okay. So if I'm going to pay the fee and this guys, this fee isn't even tax deductible. I can't even write that off on my taxes. Right. So, so why would I do this? Why would I do this when I can take the same, you know, uh, $650,000 a year? What does that come out to on a monthly, like 50 grand a month? Okay. What do we just say here up here? We can spend $40,000 a month on payroll. Okay. $40,000 a month on payroll. That's like hiring 20 staff members on a $5,000 a month salary. I think my math is right on that. Um, so that's like hiring 15, 20 staff members full time. You're hiring dozens of people full time. They're going to do your legal. They're going to do your taxes. They're going to be an executive. And that's the thing with a family office is it's your company. You get to pick what they do. If you want them to book your travel plans, by means that by all means that that's what they're going to do. If you want them to um, hire your household help, your your nanny, your butler, your maid, your whoever. By all means, that's what they're going to do. If you want somebody that all they do is they underwrite deals and they look at investment opportunities for you 40 hours a week full-time, by all means, that's what they're going to do because you're their boss and they work for you full-time and you pay them a salary to do just that. Okay. So I know this was a lot tonight. I know this is very exciting. I'm going to wrap up. Um, Maya, can you explain why the fee isn't tax deductible? You'll have to check the tax code. It's it's a it has to be above a certain percentage of AGI to be able to write that off. And it almost never will be that number. Um, so there's, there's a, there's a threshold is similar to, I think some of your insurance premiums have to be over a certain percentage of AGI, but check the tax code on that. Um, so this is, this is, I know a lot of big picture stuff and it's easy. I want to, I want to wrap up and answer a couple more questions, but it's easy to look at a course tonight and be like, I want that. Okay. I want the family office. I want to skip everything and go there. Of course you do. It's great. It's exciting, right? It's something that, that we should all be eager to do, but you don't skip steps, right? Like for me to be in shape, it's not like, okay, I want to be in shape. I'm going to go take steroids, which I did. Okay. I can vouch for that personally. No, no, no. You, you diet, you exercise, you work out and you build it up because that gives you a foundation so that it's actually yours. Okay. I used to be 215 pounds, 6% body fat. When I competed, when I got off the steroids, guys, I'm not 215 pounds and 6% body fat anymore. I didn't keep it all. It wasn't mine. Okay. Same thing with finances. If I skip steps, I'm, I'm artificially creating progress that doesn't exist. It's no different than the fed printing money. You're, you're creating something that's not there. It's not backed up by real production. It's just an empty statistic. Anyone can make an empty statistic. Okay. In a company, you want to show high sales numbers? By all means, show high sales numbers. You can. Doesn't mean you actually made money. Okay. You want to show high profit and stock numbers? Look at Enron. They cooked their books and did that. You can make any stat high. It doesn't mean it actually has anything behind it. So what do we do here? We look at where am I at? What's the current thing I'm working on? And what's the next thing? And how do I get here? Keep doing the next thing. Don't stop. Don't slow down. Don't go backwards. Don't waver. Don't try something else. Like if this is your deal, this is your deal hundred percent. Okay. If this isn't your deal, get off the fence and go find something that it is. Okay. So guys, I want to wrap this up and answer some questions. If there are any left, um, go ahead and drop those in the, the comments on zoom. All right. So let's see if we have anything here on zoom. Uh, Nano mentioned actual uh, a quote, as long as you can explain why people lose money. That's very true. So when I was, I think 21 or 22, I met with one of the top wealth managers in the country and he offered me a job. And one of the questions I had was like, because he was trading stocks and bonds that was like, what happens when you lose money? And he literally said, as long as you can explain to people why you lose money, they don't care. Okay. And in that moment, like that for me was a turning point on, okay, I, I don't think I can do this. I don't want to just be like, oh, because of reasons that's why I lost your money. Uh, Nano said a great place to start is a sacred account or gold and gold and silver subscription. That's absolutely it, guys. So like start with financial literacy and then start with a forced savings plan because the forced savings plan creates income necessity. Okay, It creates the demand to then make further progress because it pulls you. It pulls you towards your goals and your progress. At all of the questions that we have, let me just check Facebook here really quick. Uh, Aaron says that makes me want to puke so many lies. Um, that's how I felt when I learned all this. I think I, I literally felt nauseous for like 72 hours. Um, cause I was like, like I was the financial advisor. So I was like, my whole life is a lie. Everything I've known isn't true. Um, 
Awesome. I think that that's everything. So guys, we're going to wrap up here. If there are any other questions, I would love to hear from you. Send me an email. Um, if you're not a client of mine yet, you haven't read my book, Blueprint of Financial Freedom, grab a copy of this. If you go to jerryfetta.com forward slash B2F, um, that's the letter B, the number two, the letter F, you can get a copy of my book. This guy's literally like, I wrote the book so that you could do this on your own, right? Everything I talked about tonight is in this book. So if you're like, okay, I want to become financially independent. How do I do that? This is the recipe. You can do this all on your own. Now, the reason I did that is because in the financial world, like you as a consumer have every right to be skeptical. I don't expect you to hire me. I don't expect you to trust me. If you've just seen me for the first time, you're like, who is this guy? Everything is there. You don't need me. Now, if you read this and you're like, this makes sense. And also I'd like some guidance, reach out. We help. Okay. We can help you get through it. Otherwise, everything is here for you to be able to do. Um, so otherwise, yeah, grab the book, jerryfetta.com forward slash B2F. Um, we will be back again next Friday, 10 p.m. Eastern time. Um, real quick shout out. I do have a, a webinar tomorrow on how to execute on your goals. That's going to be at 4 p.m. Eastern time. If you email jerry at wealthdynamics.com, I can get you the information for that. Otherwise, guys, have a fantastic weekend. Um, I look forward to seeing you all next. And I'll talk to you next time.